Hey guys, we're back with another episode after a long break, and this time it's with the famous YouTuber Stan Prokopenko, otherwise known as Proko, which is the name of his channel. There you're gonna learn a lot about anatomy, drawing, painting, and he even has a brand new podcast out. So we did this episode quite a long time ago and we couldn't release it until now due to technical difficulties. And we were struggling with some power outages during the actual episode, so that's why if you're watching the video, there's some weird jumps in the video and kind of weird jumps in the conversation as well. But we put it back together in a nice way and it's a very valuable episode. At first, you're gonna hear about how Stan came up and his experience growing up and how he taught at Watts Atelier and how he went on to become a successful YouTuber. And then you're gonna hear his best tips later on in the episode about how to run a solid social media, how to start a YouTube channel, and even his crazy plans about how he's gonna use AI technology to teach people art in the future. So I'm excited for this one. I hope you guys are too. Enjoy. Hey guys, welcome to the Creative Mastermind Show. This week, we have the most badass guest of YouTube known to all art lovers around the world. Now that's an introduction. You talking about me? Yes, we're talking about you, Stan. Is somebody else <laughs> gonna be joining us or is that my introduction? <laughs> we're talking about Proko, who has 1.2 million followers on YouTube and is responsible for the skills of students across the world. And to me personally, I don't give compliments for no reason. I don't even like compliments, but I will say that your anatomy instruction has been the most clear, engaging, funny, and easy to learn from instruction I've ever seen in anatomy personally. Well, thank you very and much. And I have never even you, bought you any just, of the you previous You said that stuff. I'm responsible? You said I'm responsible for all these three people's skills. I don't want to take responsibility. Yes, if they fail, it is your <laughs> fault. Yes. That's not my fault. It's on your shoulders. <laughs> okay. But, uh... No refunds. <laughs> everybody go request a refund quick. But nobody will want to because I've known many people that have studied your stuff and they've learned a ton. I myself have not sadly gotten any of the premium products, but I'm sure they're even better than the free ones. Are you upset? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, Stan's gonna send me they, they uh, some for free, so it's okay. <laughs> he just found out about yeah, this. Yeah, I thought I did, never mind. But, yeah, definitely will. <laughs> but guys, uh, what is amazing about Stan is that he actually went to the same atelier as uh, Jordan and I, Watts Atelier, and he began teaching at 21, which really blows all of our minds yes, because yes. we started a little bit past 21. Yeah. So can you run us through your interest in art when you were a kid? You, you, I believe you started working on it when you were 13, right? Around that, that's when I got uh, pretty serious about it, yeah. But like, I was, int I mean, I was into drawing since I was, you know, earlier than 13. But yeah, at 13 is when I, I started doing like plein air painting and still life painting. Wow. Were stuff. you, uh, yeah. uh, I, I read a little bit about you on your website. So could you talk about, I know you were born in the States. Uh, yeah, I was, I was born in U Odessa, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, came to the States when I was okay. six. So I pretty much grew yeah. up here. But my family is very, you know, very much Ukrainian. Okay. So. Oh. I had a mix of both cultures. Do you have any artists in your family? Uh, anyone who influenced you? No. Uh, no, no artists in the family. They're mostly scientists. Okay. And, <laughs> and, uh, how, and how did you decide to, to uh, get yourself into arts? Jeez, uh, well, I mean, like I said, I was always really interested into mm -hmm. it, in, in, in drawing. Yeah. Like, when I was a little kid, I would draw all sure. the time. That's just like what my mom would make me do when she wanted me to not bother her. <laughs> uh, so, which was a lot, so you got a lot of practice, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you just give him, you know, give him some paper. Um, but, I mean, there was that, when I was 13, that's when it got, I got serious, and there was a friend of the family that my parents helped to come to the States, and in return, he helped me 
he, he trained me to do plain air painting and some And this is what age were we talking about? Like a few months. 13. Okay. That's that's what happened at 13 is some a guy came from the from Ukraine. Yes. My parents helped him come here and he helped you me. You know, plein air painting is a tough thing to start with. I remember when uh, is, Jordan yeah. and I we first got to Watts for a semester. It was uh, mm. my first class touching oil paint ever and we painted the same spot as one of your recent uh, YouTube videos where you did the plein air gestures, remember? Yeah, was it Barikitos or where did it go? I forget the name, but it's like a swampy land with a mountain in the back. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like a lagoon. And we painted probably about how you painted uh, when you were 13 on your first plein air day. <laughs> it, was, it was emotional. I doubt it. It was bad. I, I, I cried that day when I got home, literally. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, so that's really? why it's very impressive to me <laughs> when you say that you started that journey that had us crying at, uh, I was 24, you were 23, I believe. Yeah. You were doing that at 13, that's very impressive. But I wonder if at 13, uh, you'd have less of an ego about it, right? Maybe because we're crying because we expect it to be something, but if you're 13, maybe you're just having fun. Yeah, I was just having fun. I didn't know... I wasn't exposed to the amazing work that you guys are, so I, I didn't have the same standards to compare myself to. You know, like, you know, back then, I, I the only artist I really knew was the guy training me. Mm. Um, and, you know, I mean, his he was good, but his, his plein air wasn't at the level of the stuff you see at Watts. So... Uh, I guess social media is and a I was, huge... And I was 13. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Plus, social media wasn't really around, so your your sources for exactly. comparison are just not not there. Yeah, yeah. so... I did not know great mm, art at yeah. all. Uh, so then, not having seen great art, did, did you have any plans or aspirations? Did you want to be a fine artist, a fantasy illustrator? Did you have any path you wanted at that time? YouTuber uh, at that time? No, I was 13, dude. I was just trying to have fun. I was playing video games and going out making I was filming a lot of videos mm -hmm. like with my camera and stuff. So I was just doing stuff. I was I was 13. How did you transition from a 13-year-old stent who loved to draw and paint to someone who yeah. actually uh, went to to an art school? How how was it for you? Did you uh, was Watts Atelier kind of one of your um, first discoveries, or were there other art schools you went to before? Yeah, so I guess the, the, the path that I, I've talked about quite a bit in other places is that, like, in high school, I took animation every semester. Um, and so I was really into animation. I was really into Pixar. Uh, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an animator. So I started learning Maya, doing 3D. Um, and about, I think I was a junior in high school when I started taking Watts classes because I asked my, stu my, my teacher in high school if there's any schools around that I can take on How weekends. How old were you at, at this point, junior in high school? A junior in high school, yeah. And she said, well, there's this place called Watts. It, it, I mean, I lived like 20 minutes wow. away, so I was like, oh, cool. I went to visit. I thought it was awesome. So then, uh, yeah, I was taking classes at nights and weekends. Um, and over a few years, I kind of transitioned from wanting to do animation to wanting to be a fine art painter. Um, one of the things that kind of changed my mind was I got an internship uh, at Sony Online Entertainment for, I think it was like a month or something like that, working on EverQuest. And I realized that like most of what people do is just sit, kind of sit at a cubicle um, and I mean, maybe, I don't know, maybe like Pixar and DreamWorks, if you're there, maybe it's a little different, but I just did not get, it was not what I expected it yeah. to be. Like, I was having a lot more fun working on my own animation projects at home. It was really exciting. And then I w when I went to get this internship, um, it was just really boring stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, I was like, yeah, I really don't want to do this. I'm just going to try to do my own thing. Um, so that's part of the reason I switched to But you to know, art Stan, things. in a way, I, I think, I guess it's, it's kind of like a question of, of luck and, uh, and the schools that are available uh, nearby. But, yeah. you know, when you talk to a lot of artists, including myself, um, you know, the traditional schools after high school were just unavailable. For instance, there's a lot of 
uh, more of kind of a contemporary art schools that that people are exposed to without even knowing. You know, you just like graduate high school, you want to do art, you want to draw, you go to to a typical you know university or college, and uh, you're you're taught more of a kind of conceptual contemporary art, and then a lot of people yeah. later on they discover the the smaller school. So in a way, it's really great that you were able to find uh, such a strong school so early on. Yeah, absolutely. I was very lucky that it was 20 minutes from my house. And uh, did your parents have anything to do with this? And in general, what did your scientist parents think of the art path? Uh, well, my parents paid for it the first two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was, yeah, I was in high school. Um, they supported me That's great. Uh, a That's lot. That's nice. Um, and I mean, they were always afraid that, you know, art was not going to pay the bills and because a lot of the artists that they knew, um, did not, were not making it. Yeah. You know? it, it was tough to be an artist, um, especially in, like in Russia, you know, um, it, uh, so yeah, but I mean, they, they kind of like, they were scared, but they wanted to be supportive, no matter mm -hmm. what. That's so nice. they were, yeah. um, but they they were always just kind of like, oh, so are you making? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you know, I have a commission right now. And they're like, and then what? <laughs> and I always had to like defend the defend it, and but they trusted me. I mean, they, they were. And you never so. had any other plan B. You never were looking at anything else except art, right? Um, not seriously, no. I mean, I was studying, like, graphic design, making websites, programming, but I didn't, like, like I didn't go to school for programming, so I, it wasn't, like, a serious plan B, like, I'm gonna fall back yeah. on programming, because it was more of a side thing, just, you know, I got just barely good enough to kind of do my own little project. Mm -hmm. Um, build a website. So then, how soon after getting to Watts Atelier did you start showing major promise to the point of even becoming a teacher? How soon after? Yeah, after starting at uh, Watts, was it apparent that you you were onto something? Um. Well, I started teaching there. I think four or five years after starting. You were twenty-one, so, right? So. Yeah, I think so. Wow. I don't know, you probably know better than me. <laughs> you, you keep saying 21 like you're really confident about it. That sounds about right. <laughs> oh. As your uh, professional uh. biographer, yes, you started when you were 21. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> we'll go with that. I mean, let's see. Like, junior in high school is how old? Like, 16? Something about, like that? yeah. So I started pro at Watts at like 16, and then four or five years later is when I was teaching. So, yeah, about 21. So what do you think made you such a good student that allowed you to become a teacher so fast? Oh man, what did I do as a student? Um, I mean, I dedicated my, like, all my time to practicing art stuff. It wasn't completely all fine art, because remember I, I was really into animation for a few years during, uh, during Watts, and so I was learning 3D programs and um, animating and storytelling and uh, rigging and modeling while I was doing all that. But that's still very visual. Yeah, yeah. So just all, pretty much all my time was spent on a visual language. So I kind of just immersed myself in it. Um, and if you're not the age I was, it's hard to do that. It's hard to go that deep. And spent all your time. And by all, so, all your again, time, a little bit of it luck. means literally all your time, right? So no partying, no drinking, uh, nothing, wasting time like that? Um, a little bit, but not, not nearly as much as uh, you know, most people that age. Um, I would say no to, to friends all the time. And uh, um, what was it? Shit, hold on brain fart <laughs> um, oh yeah so I wasn't really watching TV very much or I, I didn't play video games after like middle school I completely mm -hmm. stopped 
video games. And so a lot of people my age were doing that, a lot of video games, a lot of TV. Were you not into video games, or did you just not have time for it? No. I just, I was more into okay. it. I liked video games, and my friends liked them, but I just... I was I was more excited about my personal projects right, right, right. that I would be like ah, I'd rather just go home and do that instead. So would that then be <laughs> the key to you kind of being more serious and the kids your age is that you found something that you're more excited about than they are excited of anything in their yeah. life? Yeah. Yeah. And for instance, you know that makes me think about when I was uh, going to college. I studied illustration, and uh, most of my classmates actually wanted to be. Uh, illustrators for specifically video games uh, so they would want to design yeah. characters so people were obsessed about video games and I, I think that was kind of a yeah. big part of, of their education and uh, but obviously you know like I, I saw for example my personal training more as a as a fine artist I'm actually curious to know about you guys like what, how, how much was a video game uh, um, influential for your careers. You know when, when I was before Watts, there was a lot of uh, influence by conceptart.org or Facebook. So I feel like I was led to this idea of becoming a Magic Card the Gathering illustrator. Yeah. Which there's okay. uh, a, lo a lot of that going on on the internet. So when I got to Watts, it was with the idea of becoming an illustrator slash concept artist. But that lasted like one semester. Mm -hmm before I completely okay. lost interest. <laughs> what about you, Jordan? <laughs> yeah, for me actually, a lot like Stan, I, I was initially interested in animation, mm. like that kind of um, mm. uh, holistic storytelling that kind of gets you wrapped up and takes you to a different place. Yeah. So for me, I was like, oh, I want to be a 2D animator, right? And then actually I started doing 2D animation. I was like, oh my God, this is so much work for <laughs> <laughs> so little payoff, <laughs> right? And I kind of resonate with uh, Stan because it's like, you want to almost have your own vision. Like you want to go your own way, right? And you yeah. can't do that as an animator until you become like, you know, a, a director, yeah. right? Yeah, so, that's a good point. Mm. Would you say that drove your interest in fine art to be able to do something that's your own vision? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's what, probably the main thing that drove me to that. Um, I didn't want to work on anybody else's story. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I didn't want to have a boss. Um, so, yeah, I, I just don't don't do well under mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Those no, it makes a lot of sense that uh, you're going to be an independent guy to go on to have such a big YouTube channel. So it makes complete sense. So. One thing I wanted to ask you is we kind of determine what makes an awesome art student and the basics of it is you just have to be the most excited one and then you're going to put in the work as a result. But in your process of teaching students at the atelier and even through your YouTube, what students have you seen that did wrong things? What's a bad student? Oh, jeez. Uh, a lot. <laughs> so, are you talking about specifically at like atelier programs? Yeah, let's say for those listening that are going to an atelier, what are some traits of a bad student that's not gonna do well? What to stay away from? Yeah, like what not um, to do. One thing, one thing that comes to mind is uh, a lot of people that would just take a lot of uh, kind of elective courses or what? What do they call them? Specialty mm -hmm. classes. You know, and, and they would not keep up with the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. um, like I would take at least, like at least half of my classes that I took would have to be either like figure drawing, quick sketch, or portrait drawing. Um, and then uh, the rest would be specialty courses that I was interested in that were outside of the core mm -hmm. fundamentals. Um, and most people just kind of did things that were fun. Um, Another thing uh, is not doing much at home. You know, you if you really only do or draw and paint or just practice in general when you're only in class, how much is that? Let's say you take like four, four or five classes. Let's say five. That's like a lot. Um, that's what three times five. That's fifteen hours a week. Yeah. That's, that's not, that's not. But that. it's not, a, I think that's a very good point because I can say from my experience being a student at that time, I actually learned things, things sunk in only at home. 
I don't think I ever understood anything yeah. in class. <laughs> it's only exactly. at home that I understood anything. You, you have to go home, get all the distraction out of the way, all the other students there, and you just have to just let it boil in yeah. your head and think about it. And, whoop. Hello? <laughs> Sorry, hold on. <laughs> that actually these these really are noise funny. canceling, and I, I boosted the noise. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so, um, yeah, you have to go home and you have to really think about it and you have to absorb yeah. and just kind of let it boil in your head. You can't just uh, expect the teacher to explain it and then it's like, boom, I got it, and then that's it. Because and you have to go home and you have to apply it to your own projects, too. That's another yeah. thing is that, like, if you learn a concept in class and then you go home... And then the next week you come back and you learn another concept. You didn't really practice those things that much. And not nearly enough in order to make it stick. Mm -hmm. But if you go home and you practice and you apply it to your own projects, that makes it stick more because you're now using it in your own way. You're finding other ways to use the same information. Um, you know, other than just life drawing. So that is to say that a student should kind of step away a little bit from the role of student and be a little bit of a practitioner here and there and apply these concepts yeah. because I've seen a lot of students yes. that are very into their student role and there never ends up being any finished works. There, it doesn't ever come to anything. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's, that, that's a really good point. I had my own projects going on bef before I even joined yeah. Watts. I had my own animations that I was working on at home where I write the story, do a storyboard, uh, design the characters, uh, and do a full-on animated short. That was before even I did Watts. When I started Watts, I would have my own illustrations that wasn't for a client. It was just a vision I had, and I would try to do it. Uh, and it wasn't for any illustration class I was taking at Watts. Yeah. What I find so interesting uh, about Stan is the kind of consistency that he's achieved, right? Because, you know, he, he's telling us that he has all these different projects, uh, yeah, he's built something individually so big. Uh, how do you feel that kind of uh, plays into your reality stand? Um, well, what do you mean by different? I I had a lot of different projects when I was in school. Right now, I'm, yeah. you know, fully committed to Proco. Yeah. So, how, what was the like dwindling down process like? Because oh. I know, like, I'm also a guy who like loves a lot of things. Yeah. So. You know, it's kind of hard to just Oh, how did you focus up and kind of decide to make that bold jump into yeah. uh, one thing? Um, well, it wasn't like all of a sudden one thing. I, I did have a lot of things going on at the same time for a while. And then eventually I was just like, what's the point of all these other things? And, and I just slow, got rid of one, things one by one. Um, you know... I started Proco, or I started a blog um, while I was at Watts. Um, I think I. Was your oh no! Actually, you no. Know, I started my YouTube channel when I was at Watts as well. Um, and how old were you? Uh, how old was I? This was six years ago. I'm 32. I was 26. Yeah. I guess 26. And that's when you 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 did your first YouTube video when you were 26. I guess. I mean, I might have been like 25 or 27, I, but around there, yeah. Do you, do you recall what that video was of and uh, what were you kind of thinking? Because back then, I don't think YouTube was uh, as clear a viable pathway as it has mm. become in the last couple of years. Yeah, so no. you must have had some unique thinking going Yeah, on I wasn't thinking, that that's what I'm saying. So it wasn't a clear like jump, like I'm gonna do this from like, at the only this now so I started the YouTube channel and at that point I was just thinking like this is going to be something that will promote my uh, my fine art career like like I did my blog on my personal website and I was just thinking it was gonna get traffic to my website and people would see my paintings and I would sell paintings that was kind of the point was just to kind of get my it's name out there and get traffic to my website. And was that working at the it time? Was, yeah, was it was, yeah. It really days. was. I mean, the blogs were getting a lot of traffic. Do you guys remember um, StumbleUpon? Yeah. yeah. So StumbleUpon yeah. was sending a lot of traffic to a few of my blog posts. Um, I don't think it was translating to art sales. 
necessarily because mm-hmm. um, a lot of people that would come on my website were maybe mostly like students artists that were just trying to get you know basic art instruction um, not collectors All right so it, it wasn't the, like the best plan um, but it did lead to good things so I mean eventually my my videos got more and more popular um, but at that same time, I was still teaching at Watts. I was still uh, represented by Gallery Russia uh, in Scottsdale. Mm-hmm. Um, I was doing com- commissions. Yeah, and you were even invited uh, by Gallery Legacy to be represented as yeah. well. Yeah, I was. But I was with Gallery Russia at the time, and I felt like they were... Well, actually, no. I think I, that was, I, was, I was choosing between the two. I chose Gallery Russia because I felt like mm-hmm. they would um, they would have more time and energy to focus on me whereas whereas legacy mm-hmm. was is so big they have so many artists that are way better than me and you know that uh are so much more expensive than me like why would they focus on me who is just starting my prices are super low they wouldn't they wouldn't push mm-hmm. my paintings they wouldn't hang my paintings in a great spot in the gallery they'd be in the in the back mm-hmm. corner where nobody would find them um, so I figured like it would be better with Gallery Russia, they're going to actually focus on trying to sell my stuff. Oh, so that's an interesting strategy. So yeah, what Stan just brought up is to consider in the gallery that you're thinking about what kind of a player will you be in that gallery. Yeah. And uh, Stan's kind of saying that if you're not going to be at the top of that list, maybe it's worth it to actually go to a a less prestigious gallery in order to be a bigger fish in the gallery. Yeah. That's an interesting point because I, I, I've never thought of it this way. You know, most artists think the, the more prestigious the gallery, the better. But uh, in a way, it's, it's a very good point that, you know, if you're with a yeah. very expensive gallery, I mean, and if you're just a beginner, they're not really going to, you know, tell the world that they have your paintings. They're probably going to focus on people with uh, with huge names. Yeah. And you just happen to be someone... And it doesn't them. necessarily mean that's the path for everybody. Um, but yeah. for a lot of people who are... who maybe are, are really young and who don't have a name, um, who are still really trying to figure themselves out as painters, like, tr- getting into a huge gallery probably not a good idea. They're gonna expect way too much from you. Mm-hmm. They're not gonna try to grow with mm-hmm. you. Um, but like somebody, like for example, uh, Morgan Weisling, he was an illustrator for like, tw- mm-hmm. I don't know, like 20 years or something before he even he be- became a fine art painter. Um, he jumped into fine art and he just skyrocketed immediately. He had his first solo show. Wow. That was his intro to, uh, to fine art, it was just a solo show with a bunch of paintings and he sold out. He wow. sold out on like the opening <laughs> night. <laughs> Um, but I mean, start. he already had an illustration, a full illustration career before that. And so he was able right. to just, you know, get it going overnight. Um, so for, for someone like that, it, it's not the best option. And I'm sure there's other situations where that's probably not the best option, but it. And it also depends on, I think the person's mentality where some people kind of want there to be a logical buildup and yeah. a logical amount of pressure that they can take whereas some other people are less susceptible to stress so they may want to jump the gun and just start at a higher level raise their prices a little higher than they yeah. they ought to be perhaps and they can kind of deal with that sometimes but it's not for everyone I'll yeah say. it's not um. so it seems uh, as your official biographer that you're actually doing quite well in the fine art world and you had a great start at, at it in an early age. Yeah. And uh, I'm just surprised that those wins didn't cause you to focus on fine art. So what happened there? Why did you kind of uh, let those wins go? Well, they did. Help, they did help me focus on fine art. I was... Um, when I got into the gallery, Gallery Russia, I did do a... A whole series of paintings. I, I traveled to Ukraine with with Jeff, and we took a bunch of photos. And I did a bunch of I, I did a whole series of paintings and put them in the gallery, and they were selling. Um, and then I mean, just my channel got I think an even bigger win 
my YouTube channel. Mm. And then I slowly nice. started just kind of putting more and more focus into that. Um, yeah. I was trying to balance the two for a long time, uh, and it didn't, you know, it didn't work. Eventually, YouTube yeah, won, first. and I was like, okay, I'm gonna pause. And when, my heart. at what point? So, what was that moment like when you looked at your YouTube, you looked at your fine art, and you officially said, "I'm going to be a YouTuber." That's what I am. Uh, jeez, I don't know if there was that moment. Um, Still hasn't happened. No, well. No, I guess not. I, I still consider myself a, a, like a fine art painter. I just, it's on pause. Course, it's on pause. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm going to mm -hmm. do it. Yeah. Um, well, can I ask you, how many, how many paintings are you able to produce, let's say, um, you know, in, per month? Right now? If, if it's, yeah. Are you talking about right now? Yeah, like, let's say 2018. <laughs> how many just paintings like did that. I make in 2018? I don't, I don't know, yeah. three? <laughs> okay. I'm like, nothing. Yeah, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you're planning to get back to the fine art game later on? Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to do it yeah. soon, as, actually. I want to make it part of the YouTube channel as well. So. Okay, so. nice. Are you going to be vlogging about uh, your advancements in that's paintings? The, that, that's the that plan, yeah. Sweet, yeah, yeah that's, that's exciting. Yeah. So can you just tell us about kind of the, what I'm curious about is we're with the stand that just started as YouTube. Uh -huh. What are, I, I didn't go back far enough on your channel, I must say. What were those videos like? Uh -huh. uh, you were shooting them by yourself, <laughs> editing them yourself. Can you just tell us about kind of the early, early, early YouTube? Uh, well, they were a little cringy. Like the first video I ever made, I did not publish it. <laughs> yeah, I finished it halfway <laughs> and I, I just kept watching it. I was like, oh, I cannot publish. This is horrible. It was really cr funny. Did you film it on VHS? No, 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 no. It was filmed. <laughs> it was filmed all the same way um, as the one that I actually did end up publishing first, which is the. And what were you struggling with in that video? Your your camera performance, ca like you on camera. My camera or? performance was really bad, and it improved. It improved a lot to the second one. So I, I learned. Quickly, but it was still even that that second one, which was my first one that I published. It was still, you know, kind of cringy. Um, I think when you go through my videos, you can tell I, I get a lot more comfortable. Obviously, it's you know that that's good to know. Uh, as guys that are kind of starting out in the in the video world, uh, my first video was actually done in collaboration with you. Yeah, and well, uh, that was a great video. <laughs> you did really well. Yeah, I mean, I'm just great right off the bat, but I did realize <laughs> that. Uh, seeing how people go from their first video to where they're at now, it really is relaxing to know that we're gonna get so much Absolutely, better yeah. Yeah. at videos. So yeah, but it's not, anybody that's kind of starting out can expect yeah, that. But yeah, and then practice, it's not just the, your camera presence. I mean, I, my first video, I didn't shoot with that infinity white wall, right? So I was still trying right. to figure out the style of video. I was like, how, what is this gonna be like? Is this right. gonna be kind of like a vlog where I'm just like in there in the room? But it was so weird because I was doing all this in my bedroom and it's like, my bed is right there in the background. And mm -hmm. I'm talking about, the first video I made was how to photograph your artwork. Um, mm. That's very useful. Yeah. I feel like you should remake that. Yeah, I actually have, I still haven't gone back and redone that video. I, I don't have a video on how to photograph your artwork, but it, it was weird because, you know, I'm like photographing, I'm showing people and my bed is right there. And I, it's, mm -hmm. it just looked really weird. And I was awkward on camera mm -hmm. at the same time. And just, I just hated it so much. And so I, I, I went back and I was like, okay, how can I make this not awkward? So I was like, okay, infinity white wall looks professional. So I bought a background. I tried out a few test runs and I'm like, okay, this is good. And then, and then I got my confidence and I went and I made my first video. Um, so changing the environment to kind of a more professional looking one also gave you a professional mindset to go with Yeah, it. hide the fact that I'm in my small bedroom uh, at my parents' house, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> so uh, what are then some other tips that an early YouTuber who's still awkward, monotone like me, uh, what are some of the things we can do to get better camera presence? Ooh. Um, always try to pretend that you're actually talking to somebody. Um, I think people focus on either the camera lens 
or they focus on their own, they're like in their own mind. They're trying to listen to themselves talking while they're saying it. And mm-hmm. when you mm-hmm. talk to someone naturally and you're in flow, you're not hearing yourself. You're, you're, you're speaking, you're just naturally, it just comes out. Um, yeah. So they, you just, there's a self-analysis that happens as soon as you turn on the camera. Um, and so you, you got to try to get past that and pretend you're actually talking to a person. Um, so do you imagine a specific friend, perhaps? Or do you maybe put uh, a girlfriend there or a family member? <laughs> you could. You dog? could. I didn't do that. What I did was I made a SpongeBob cutout because it was <laughs> it was actually real. It worked really well because I printed it out on a... SpongeBob is a rectangle, so it was like, okay, I'm just gonna print out a SpongeBob. And I made a hole the size of a camera lens right under his eyes, like right in the middle. And I would, <laughs> and I put it on the lens and it would cover the camera. And I would just talk to SpongeBob. Yeah. Um, but that only worked for like a few videos, and then I was, it was, it ended up being a little, maybe a little distracting. Um, <laughs> you made two good friends with yeah. him. Their relationship grew too much. Yeah, at that point, I, I, just didn't, I think I didn't need it anymore. At that point, I started imagining, like, an audience, like yeah. students. Well, I've got to say, you know, I, I, there, there, are lots of, uh, there are lots of instructional videos out there, but, man, yours are just so fun to watch. And, you know, sometimes I just watch them, not because I'm, I haven't learned that in the past, but... Just the way you deliver the content, it's so sharp, mm. crisp, the quality of sound, the quality, and the content, it's very interesting. Uh, and it's been good for a while, too. Like, I remember when I first yeah. came across your channel, Stan, like, uh, was the Anatomy series? Mm-hmm. I think we were both going to Watts at that time. And, yeah, that's when so I that first saw That must have been, like, it. what, like, six years ago? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's been good for a while. Oh, yeah. And, like, I feel like, yeah, how did you really, like, step into that kind of quality so quickly? Yeah, I think it, I think I figured out my rhythm after like a year. I think after the portrait course, I think I I think I had it down. Like when I started the figure drawing course, I think it was I was very mm-hmm. very comfortable. I knew my style, and I was just making videos. Um, yeah, and then I did the full figure course, and then I started anatomy, and then and yeah, by then I already had a team. Well, not a team. I had when I started anatomy, I had actually not just me. Yeah, no, it was just me. But I had an animator. So you were animating no. uh, Skelly, the the digital. No, skeleton. on my it, at uh, I was at home just by myself. But I did have a f- uh, freelance modeler, a rigger, mm-hmm. and an editor, or not an editor, um, an animator that would help me uh, with just the animation part. Everything else was was me. And then like after the bones of the torso, that's when I started hiring someone in-house to be there with me editing, uh, helping me just nice. run the business. And uh, when, you, when you got the animators and all that help, at that point, was it a leap of faith where you were taking a financial risk or were you already net positive on the channel and you were just kind of taking it out of what you earned or was this you had to dip in a big negative for a hope of no, getting I was, a positive I was way? Make, I was uh, making profit by then. Um, and so I, I hired what I could afford and pretty much mm-hmm. like every year we hire more people because profits go up. Um, so it started, like I was able to get it profitable by the, you know, figure, figure was a very popular course. Um, yeah. so after figure, once I started anatomy, I started thinking about, you know, well, not, I guess once I started anatomy, I started getting freelancers, and then uh, a little bit into it, I was actually able to get like a full-time person that comes in every day. Um, How many people do you have nowadays? Uh, at the office now, we have four plus me, and then freelancers, we have like a dozen, like 12 or something. Oh, you you have an office. You, yeah, that's a lot of. Yeah, we're at the office the right now. I don't know if you guys saw my latest video. We're we're gonna be remodeling. We're gonna be. Yeah, yeah I, I actually yeah I saw yeah I saw that that was that was really exciting. You know what I'm saying? Actually, I'm gonna say so when I was in college, I remember 
uh, I remember watching some Glenn Vilpool's videos, uh-huh. and when I saw when I saw your interview with the guy, I said to myself, "Wow, what a you know, he's such a legendary character, and uh, it's so cool that you you met him and yeah. uh, uh, and what what was it? Can you can you talk a little bit? I'm I was just super curious about this. Like, was he a big influence for oh, you? Oh, absolutely. Because uh, a... you know how I was interested mm-hmm. in animation in high school. My yeah. high school animation teacher would show Vilpu's uh, VHS tapes in class. Yes. He would sh- <laughs> he would play a lesson, uh, you know, every few weeks or something. We would learn something from him and apply it. Uh, he had a bunch of his tapes. Um, so yeah, oh, and then I got his book. I think I was in high school when I got mm-hmm. Vilpu's book. Um, yeah. Yeah, so he, Vilpu was a huge influence. One of the first huh. teachers that I, one of the first like famous teachers that I even heard about. Yeah. Because I was in high school still. Um, and he was one of the first that I reached out to because he was someone who I really looked up to. He, he was almost like a pre-YouTube yeah. video Yeah, he was pre he was He was too early. Um, yeah. he, I mean, he was way pre YouTube, obviously. I mean, he was he was teaching yeah, yeah. at Disney, you know, decades ago. Yes, yeah. it's, <laughs> it's so cool. I loved seeing. Uh, I love the fact that you brought this guy that made this video where he talks somewhere in the distance, and you can kind of sort of see you that shaky camera, <laughs> and then you bring back this crisp, amazing quality, but the same master. Uh huh. I mean, thank you. This was so <laughs> cool to watch. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Yeah, 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 that was awesome. Yeah. So, did you have anybody to kind of model in terms of instructional videos other than Glenn, or were you kind of on your own paving the way for everyone else? Ooh, who did I model? I I definitely wasn't modeling any art instruction videos because I didn't I didn't see any good art instruction online at that time. I know now when I go back and I I know there was good instruction because. I've learned about it after that. You know, since then, I've learned that there, people existed. Like Bobby Chee's schoolism was already around way before me, but I never heard about it until like way after. Um, so I, did, I wasn't modeling it uh, off of him. Um, I think I was just trying to make the best possible video, and I didn't like the format, which was very common back then, was they just turn on the camera and let it roll and then post what it recorded. I yeah. just, I was more into, let's make a little film. Let's write a story, let's write a script, figure out the best way to teach this information and present it uh, in the best way possible. Um, so I, yeah. I don't and know. it worked too, because uh, I find that anatomy instruction can be susceptible to dryness, <laughs> I think as we all know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you used humor and uh, engaging animations to keep even the most ADD teenager <laughs> learning this stuff, and I find that to be very, very impressive. Cool, thank you. I think it's pretty great too how um, you said you were modeling people who were not artists, right? Like a lot of time uh, as artists, we look to other artists for things that might not necessarily be their strengths, mm-hmm. right? So like you were saying about the videos, yeah. right? Artists were kind of making like the you know, the, the Vilpu style where it's like the camera's way off, it's got the bad audio, because that's all the standard was for, for at the time, yeah. but in other industries, they were making great video content. Yeah. So that you grab that, I think that's so cool. Yeah. And I think there might be other ways too that artists could do that. Yeah, there are a lot of industries where video quality was really good. Like, I mean, 3D animation was really popular. I mean, watching these Pixar animations and I'm like, wow, this is so fun. Like, I'm just drawn to the story and like, they have little jokes that pop up and visually interesting the whole time. And I was inspired by that and said, like, why can't, you know, education be like that too, so. Yeah. yeah. You could even say that about your path as an artist, right? Because the typical path was, you know, become a fine artist, become an illustrator. Like, there was no artist YouTubers, yeah. right? <laughs> that wasn't a thing. But people were YouTubers at the time just for other, yeah. other topics. True. Yeah. It's a very good point. I guess, Stan, you're a combiner of the best of different disciplines, it seems like. Yeah, I do I do definitely like to cross-train on very different things and then combine them. Yeah. 
And what are you using now? Are you reading uh, kind of marketing books like Gary Vaynerchuk type stuff to, to help you out? What, what yeah. else are you looking at nowadays? Um, I did read a lot of business books. I don't, not so much anymore. Now I'm more focused on actual creation um, and not much absorption. You know, like so. I which ones helped you at the time when you were when you were still checking oh, them geez. out? Um, Gary Vee was was a big one. Uh, Tim Ferriss, um, Four Hour Work, or you know that's Tim Ferriss. Um, Mixergy, if you if anyone's ever heard of mm-hmm. the Mixergy podcast, he's, they're still around. Um, but they they interview or he, God, I forgot Andrews Andrew something. He interviews a new business person like every day about their business and what wow. helped them succeed. And so I was l- listening to that every morning when I'd go walk my dog and then I would come back and I'd have all these ideas. Um, yeah, me too. I mean, that's so that's so rare. That's why you are who you are is because you're an artist that is not afraid to look at a variety of sources and I uh, read Gary Vaynerchuk yeah. uh, and all these things are helpful, but we have a lot of artists that just paint or draw and they, they don't really know about anything else yeah. and I feel like that limits their career so much yeah when I had uh, my son he's about a year and a half now um, when I was I took a few months off just pretty much completely off I didn't come into mm-hmm. the office and um, I had to I, I can't just not do stuff you know but I had to do something where I didn't need my hands yeah. and so I would like I would watch and listen to um AI courses, mm-hmm. you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and I got I got really into it, and I started learning like, you know, calculus and, and some of that stuff, um, statistics, and um, I I started learning Python a little bit. I didn't get fa- as far as I wanted to with it, but I it got me interested enough in the AI field that I started working with some AI companies uh, to do some experiments with AI and applying it to art education and so that's what we're, I'm what I'm doing now that's like my oh can you tell us more on that um, yeah sure I mean <laughs> we're the first we're the first project we're probably gonna release is a perspective checker so you'll draw a box um, you'll upload it and this machine learning thing will analyze your box mm-hmm. and tell you what's wrong with it Damn. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, sweet. Yeah, and it, it knows one point, two point, and three point perspective. Um, but right now, it's a simple box. Like you can't you can't give it more than that. Where so it's very simple right now. Um, but the, it there's so much so many steps it has to go through in order to really get to the conclusion of what is wrong with this box and how can I correct it um, that. If we try to do too many things at once, it would just be, there'd be way too many bugs, it would take forever. So we started with a box. But to kind of engage our fantasy a bit, what would be your kind of end game with AI? (laughs) Is the end game game. to create an AI proco that we can submit our art for critique by robot? Pretty much. I think that robots, or not robots, I think that um, software, will is better at judging uh, the technical side of art than humans are human teachers um, I'm not saying I'm not saying creativity I know that everyone listening is gonna be like oh my god we're all gonna die <laughs> it's like okay <laughs> just come back here okay you're going over there like bring it back here I'm talking about drawing right now okay I'm not talking about like weapons of mass destruction um, so, <laughs> <laughs> destroying artists. <laughs> Seriously. Um, so, like, perspective is just math, right? Mm-hmm. Calculators, a simple calculator is be- way better than you at math. Um, proportions, mm-hmm. you know, a computer can judge proportions down to the pixel. You cannot. Um, anatomy, it could, you know, th- if you train it proper anatomy, uh, and you give it a, a, a very realistic 3D model of it. You know, it, this would be very hard, but it could apply that to a drawing. And, and yeah, it, it, there's a lot of things. Color, you know, color science. It could be a lot better at color mm-hmm. science than than your brain. So there's a lot of things in art that 
a machine can do better than a human. There's some things that it sh probably shouldn't, like we should keep at, as humans, you know, humans doing. But the purpose of this isn't to replace artists, which is what I think a lot of people listening to this are now are thinking. It's like, why would you want to replace <laughs> artists? Like, no, I'm trying to replace Still art to be the teachers. last artist. I'm trying to replace art teachers yeah. and, and or make education more accessible. Exactly, and not because I think art teachers yeah. shouldn't have jobs. It's so that more people have access to art teachers. Because Absolutely. there's That's so few goal. good schools around. There's not nearly enough. Yeah. You know, there's millions of people trying to learn how to draw right now. How exactly. many school? like, are there enough schools to, to accept millions of people? I'm like, no, absolutely not. Um, well, not only that, you know, actually it's such an interesting topic because uh, recently I was talking to someone who uh, teaches at uh, university and, you know, I was discussing uh, the way university courses are sometimes taught and, you know, this person was telling me that, yeah, you know, the way I teach portrait painting is rather from, um, you know, conceptual approach and whatever. Mm -hmm. But I remember actually when I briefly studied in university and I didn't, didn't you know, graduate because it was just... Uh, they didn't focus enough on the technical side and oftentimes students suffer yep. uh, with this kind of a lack of knowledge and oftentimes props don't, don't even know how to show them yeah, exactly. uh, the, the proper way so so I mean not everybody has the means to travel to a place that has an atelier and can afford uh, yeah, you know, just m moving away. So this is a really interesting yeah uh, approach to to education. Yeah, there's That's a lot of good arts, or a lot of art schools around, but most of them aren't good, and so yeah. people are wasting their money where they instead they could just pay for like a subscription to this AI, exactly. and to get yeah. better training or not better training necessarily, get better feedback from it. Mm -hmm. You know, like you you submit your art, your drawing, and you get let it check certain aspect of it and you get that feedback loop right like like yeah. that's so important because through video we can teach as humans what we can teach them we can um interact Absolutely. that's more fun yeah. that's we can connect with a the student they feel like there's actually someone there teaching them and then but then they need yeah. a critique they need to draw and then give it to someone and have them check it i can't like yeah. i have millions of subscribers it. but i can't check everyone's work it's impossible but the, the other worry is that with just video alone, I worry that a lot of people are enjoying your video mm -hmm. and they may forget to do the, the drawing. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, with this AI subscription uh, model that you're working on, they would actually be encouraged to do their own homework and submit it. But without the need to submit homework, my worry is most of these students might not they might watch your video and it might not carry out the concepts that you outlined yeah, in the video. Yeah, most people don't. So that, I mean, that's one of the things that uh, I, we were talking about, like, you know, what's a be who's a bad art student? It's where it's the same person that would go to class and be there in class and then go home and not actually practice it. You know, the same person would watch mm -hmm. a video, think that they learned the concepts and then not practice it. It's the same, you know, the same thing. People are lazy. They'd rather do something that's easier on their ego uh, you know, and, which is not failing. Um, mm -hmm. do, you, do you feel that kind of the, um, the environment today is not great for learning a skill? What, what I mean to say is right now we have the environment of social media, of quick little bits of information. It's hard for people to focus for a long time and it's hard for people to take criticism. Do you feel the environment is difficult for students now? Well, what do you mean? Pe people aren't able to take I mean, the, the, br the mental environment, the, the brain wiring that is caused by the technology that we're using today. Mm. I feel like students are not in as good of a position as, let's say, 200 years ago to go on a path to mastery. Huh. Maybe, yeah. Or maybe they're on a better <laughs> I don't know Run. there's advantages and disadvantages yeah we are kind of spoiled yeah. we're a lot more spoiled than people spent years ago for sure um, there's a ton of uh, of content but what I'm worried about is I think that people have the wrong mindset a lot of the time 
where they're not willing to do the hard thing. Yeah. Even if they do end up going to the atelier, like you said, people take those fun classes. Mm -hmm. They avoid uh, classes they're bad at. Like I was terrible at quick sketch. Um, I was taking it every time at first, but then I folded and I just stopped signing up to quick sketch. Yeah. So things like that, that I feel like the young listener is susceptible to because of social media and just how mm. the environment works nowadays. Yeah, maybe. Um, I mean, maybe I'm not the best person to to really comment on that, but probably there's there's some social things happening that <laughs> you know may are spoiling us a little bit. Yeah, th things have just sh shifted. I, I guess we're well, you know we talk about art in the nineteenth century. Oftentimes, people would just focus on one thing and do yeah. it because there was not much distraction. You know, that's what you yeah. do. Whereas uh, when you're exposed to so many, so many uh, things around, especially on social media, it can be distracted. But at the same time, it can kind of keep you informed about the direction of art. And in a way, I guess people, by being exposed and being so informed, we, we get maybe inspired to, to compete. And when you realize how competitive this world is, Maybe that's raising the bar at the same time. That's a good point. I think for those motivated, the seeing what everyone else is doing is actually very helpful. Yeah. Whereas for those less motivated, it can hurt their feelings and exactly. they yeah. just quit. I mean, I don't know. I, I feel like we are, because we are living today, we are able to see all of the artists and students that don't make it. And so we think that there's more of them. And then when we look back in history, we don't see the ones that are forgotten. Yeah, you know, but yeah. like when you look at all of the really, really amazing artists today, like there's a lot of them. There's a lot of people that have yeah. reached mastery and are just as good as mm -hmm. people from the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. it, there's people that are so freaking good. They, uh, I mean, if they were living back then, maybe they wouldn't be as good because they didn't have as many resources. But who yeah. knows? I mean, I'm, but I, I don't think that we are producing worse artists right now. Uh, so where do you think with this technology, the AI project that you're working on, mm -hmm. where do you think art skill is going? Are we about to hit the new mm -hmm. height of human artistic achievement in the next few years? Not in the next few years, no. Um, I mean, I think we are approaching that, what you just said, and not just in art, but in everything. I think mm -hmm. AI is going to help people learn everything it's going to be a better teacher um and so and it's going to be a better scientist it's going to be a better everything um and so it's gonna it's gonna help s humans become i think better humans i think that's I have very an refreshing to hear <laughs> that's that's an incredibly interesting point because you know for for someone who uh, teaches traditional approach mm -hmm. to uh, talk about kind of a non-traditional uh, teaching method is uh, is very refreshing. Mm -hmm. It's it's something di different, but it makes a lot of sense what you're saying. So it's uh, yeah, it's quite exciting. But it's really difficult. And uh, so it, it's it's going to take more than like a few years, I think, to to really get it to a point course, where yeah. it can teach you everything. Like a box, like we already did it. Like I have the pro like not the prototype, the the like the first the second version of the software and it works like th there's yeah. still bugs i don't yeah. want to release it yet but it works like we we had huh. uh john who who's the worst artist on our team um oh he's not here like, Hello. um he he did a box he tried to make it the best possible and then we uploaded it and, and it corrected it correctly um and then i drew a box and it was perfect <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was slightly off. Do you feel that YouTube is one of the best social media platforms that an artist can use for their art career? For learning or to become? Oh like no, an this is for this is for professionals. Now. Okay, so for okay, it's so not students anymore. Now we're talking about a professional artist wants to yeah, get the career uh, going. Yes. Yeah. Um, now, now we know how to paint, but we want to promote ourselves. Uh, what are some places that you would emphasize? Uh, Instagram, YouTube, or Facebook or, or where? Yeah, so YouTube, the barrier to entry as far as time commitment is extremely high. 
it, you mm -hmm. can't put in just a few, you know, a few hours a week and and have any kind of impact. Um, video takes a lot of money, takes a lot of time, uh, a lot of headaches. Mm -hmm. uh, you so you can't just dabble in it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know what? A, a, a smart person would be able to to figure it out how to do it real quickly. So mm -hmm. maybe you know. That's bad advice, but you know, someone maybe could just turn on a camera and talk, and and have a really good, successful YouTube channel. It's going to be way harder though than other social media platforms like Instagram. Um, if you're an artist and you want to promote your art, if you're already creating art on a regular basis, and it's good, you could take a picture, upload it to Instagram, and you'll gain a following. Um, so the barrier of entry is much smaller than on YouTube, but if you do, if it makes sense for what you do, uh, YouTube can be very powerful, yes. Okay, so if I'm, this is my new favorite question. Um, I like to ask about kind of any field. Let's say I'm a beginning art YouTuber. Mm -hmm. Why am I going to fail? Not me specifically, but because of your why haircut. would an art YouTuber <laughs> fail? Sorry, I missed the question. Because of my haircut, <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, sorry, I missed the question. What do you mean? Uh, if you're so what? So let's say that we have a beginning uh, YouTuber yep. that's starting out. Oh, okay. What are some of the likely things that are going to make them fail? Okay, so pro artist, beginning YouTuber. Uh, oh, jeez. Yeah. For example, okay, actually look at my channel. Let's say it, me, Pavel. I, I have a YouTube that's got a thousand people on it and I'm posting time lapses yeah, hold on, let me, of my paintings. Let me pull it up. So why it, am I going to fail at YouTube? YouTube, Pavel, Soko. Okay. Yeah, right now it's just some uh, time lapses of uh, paintings. Uh, there's no variety in content. I'm not even in it. Okay, here's one so, reason. Uh, you uploaded, the last time you uploaded was two months ago. And two months okay, ago so you uploaded five videos. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you uploaded two videos the month before that, one video before that, three videos before that. And yeah, so you stopped. You stopped three, two months ago for some reason. You didn't upload anything. So consistency is huge. Um, I don't know if the quality of these is is oh I think they're all like a minute less than a minute long. Yeah, they're just little time lapses. Oh, uh, I no, just that's meant to use work. myself as a general example, but what we learn here is you gotta pick a consistent amount of output that you can do, and you can't just go hard for a month and then stop for two months. Yeah, you have to dedicate yourself to a certain structure yeah and you have to compete with what's what's with what's out there like you're putting out these 52 second videos where it's just a time lapse nobody cares the, the youtube mm -hmm. is not the platform for one minute time lapse videos it that would do much better on instagram and it probably mm -hmm. did do much did you upload these to instagram yeah, yeah, no, uh, they did great. The one of uh, my girlfriend did great on uh, Instagram. I think I got 40,000 views on Instagram, which is my yeah, and then, biggest post I've ever done. And then on YouTube, I think I got 20,000, I think. Yeah, oh, 24, Maybe. and that's the latest video. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, then, uh, and that's just the time lapse as well? Yeah, so what okay. we learned there is that if you're going to go on YouTube, you need to have the most engaging long form content. You can't just be putting short little snippets. Out. Yeah. And I mean, I'm actually surprised you got 24 for a one minute video in your. Oh, premium. the way I did it is I, uh, I posted on Reddit and the thread did well. That's oh, so Reddit it's did not well. through. Okay. So yeah, Reddit did well. It, okay, and that makes sense. Oh, did you use things like Reddit or other things to funnel into your channel? Yes. Um, I mean, not like, that wasn't like a huge thing I was doing. But like, yeah, mm -hmm. I was posting things to Facebook, to, um, and then to Instagram. Now I post everywhere. I still post on LinkedIn. Um, wow, well, yeah, LinkedIn. Yeah, right, I know. But some, there's people that still share on there and they comment and it's way smaller, but I have all the content, I just post. Like it, it doesn't, you know, and I, yeah. well, I don't. 
some of that, that's a good lesson where even when a platform is kind of uh, dying down because I know for for all of us here Facebook got quiet so I personally stopped posting uh, on Facebook yeah. basically almost at all well uh, would you advise against that what against stopping on Facebook uh, against yeah. kind of stopping platforms that are the engagement dropped so our reaction was to just stop doing it at all um, I would advise against that, yeah. I still post okay. on Facebook um, mm -hmm. because, yeah, it, they do kind of uh, punish you if you're yeah. a company. Like, if you have a page that's not very, like, a personal profile, they want you to pay for advertising, so they, like, they really right. punish you. But, um, like, my recent video, for example, uh, of Kim Jong-gi, um, was is really popular on YouTube. It's like eight hundred thousand mm -hmm. or something right now, or maybe not. I don't remember. But on on Facebook, it got even more. It's like over a million. Wow! So oh, wow. hey, that's that a surprise. They Facebook beat more. Yeah. Uh, how how do you think that happened? Is it because Kim know. Jong Gi's <laughs> uh, audience on Facebook is very big, or? Um, maybe. I don't know exactly. I mean, they were both very, they, they both performed very well. They're both around a million. Um, yeah. But I'm just saying that, like, yeah, most of your posts maybe are going to get less. You're getting kind of punished for some reason. But there's going to be a few that really, that go up, and then they'll, they'll bring attention to all your other stuff. It doesn't take much effort to post on more than one if you're posting the same thing. You know, like, like mm -hmm. I post video, like my videos on pretty much everything. And, and I'll, I'll make like a few social images. Cause like, I don't like to post just the video on Facebook. I'll post a, a picture and then like a description and a, and a link to the video. Um, and then I will, after that, upload the video native to Facebook as well. Um, mm -hmm. And then on Instagram, well, I can't post the full video, so I'll just upload an image. Yeah. But like, it's the same on like Twitter and Instagram and then on, on Facebook and on LinkedIn. Well, you just tweak it for the, for the platform. Yeah, like some of the, sometimes I'll change the, the description for different platforms, depending on like the kind mm -hmm. of audience that's there. Uh, but the image mm -hmm. that I create, why not post that image on Facebook as well? You know, it doesn't take that long. If you have a system, okay. you could knock them out real quick. Yeah. And what about using collaborations to grow your channel? Because the very first thing I did on YouTube was collaborate with you. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of how I started off both our podcast and my own channel. As I started off the back of uh, your viewers. Uh, what do you think <laughs> about that? <laughs> that's great. Yeah, you, uh, <laughs> what you did a great I job. Used you. How does that make you feel? <laughs> yeah, you were just a pawn in my in my chess game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think I got more views out of uh, that collab than you did. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, sorry, you know. <laughs> what do you think of that? <laughs> um, but no, yeah, that's I it. It's a, collabs are are very good because it. In introduces you to someone else's audience. There's going to be a big overlap, probably, because we're following a lot of the same people. But, um, yeah. you know, it, there's going to be new people that have never heard of you that follow that other person, and they're fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. yeah, they are. Uh, we had a great time. Alex was actually right there beside me filming it, and uh, it took us like. I think 13 oh, hours to yeah, do a three-hour yeah. video, uh -huh. but uh, well, it was a great experience actually. Yeah. Which makes me think about what you mentioned earlier about the amount of effort that it takes to produce one video mm -hmm. versus a post on Facebook or Instagram where you can just take a photo, even a professional photo yeah. doesn't take you the amount of time it takes to do an average video that you film with your phone. Yeah. And uh, that day when we were setting up for that skull painting, uh, I mean, we're blown away how much time. Oh, setting up the lighting, getting the painting I mean, not to glare. Yeah, there's a lot. It's a ridiculous amount of time. I mean, eventually oh, you I get, could, you yeah. kind of develop uh, a template for every type of video. Yeah. You know, like the first time you're trying to figure every little thing out. So it's really hard. But the second time you guys yeah. do it, it's going to be way easier. Exactly. So, yeah, there's yeah, a lot of it. Just, it gave us a whole new level of respect because I was even at home and. 
my job was to read the script I wrote at home, right? How, how hard can that be? Yeah. And uh, that was actually probably the top number one most frustrating thing about creating that video mm -hmm. was trying to read the script in a way where I don't sound like a, like a robot Terminator or something. Mm -hmm. Or like a talking printer or something. <laughs> it was very challenging. So for anyone that is wanting to get into YouTube, you just got to know that this is going to take some time, some effort. You're going to have to work on your vocal skills, which uh, I still need a lot of training in. <laughs> and, yeah. and there's editing too on top of that, right? Oh, the editing your team right. did probably took like 20 hours, 25 I don't want to speak for you, I don't really know, but I'm assuming about 20 hours of, of work that uh, Sean put in. Maybe more, I'm not sure. But yeah, no, if you add up all the time that it takes us to make like an anatomy video, it's like hundreds of hours. Wow. Yeah, so when you guys are watching a 15 minute video, yeah, appreciate the minutes. hundreds of hours hundreds of behind of it. Hours. Yeah. But it really shows, I mean, a well edited content uh, when, when I saw the video that was shot on a GoPro and a, and a cell phone mm -hmm. and like a DSLR, I don't remember what exactly we used. Yeah. And then to watch the final result on YouTube and how fun and interesting yeah. and entertaining it was when it was all put together, you, you kind of really appreciate the, the job of a... How low my shirt opened up. Yeah. <laughs> how much chest hair was visible. Yeah, you mentioned GoPros um, and iPhones. Like, those are great cameras now. Like, you... you like a, a shitty camera now is really good. Um, like yeah. you don't need the, uh, really expensive cameras to make a good video anymore. Uh, what you yeah. do need is is you need to know how to use them correctly. You need to tell a good story. Uh, you need to have you need to keep your audience engaged. You could do it with a really really bad camera and still keep them engaged. Um, That's a really good uh, point. So this means that anybody listening. There's no financial barrier no, there isn't. to start your YouTube, but there is an effort and skill barrier where you have a long road of practice ahead of you, yes. but you don't need to get the best camera to get started. No. Yeah, if, you're, if you want to get started and your, your excuse of not getting started is that you can't afford the camera and all the lights and the mic great microphone, like, that's not an excuse because that is not yeah. going to make your video good. It will definitely make it... A little more watchable and maybe put it over the edge but like if you look at my first video like the, the quality wasn't that great um, mm -hmm. it, but there was there was a lot of experience teaching behind that that mm -hmm. made it something people wanted to so share. So it's content first and yeah. equipment second. Yeah if I film that if I filmed a video about how to draw the head from any angle on a red camera, like a you know, a thirty thousand, forty thousand yeah. dollar camera. <laughs> but I was just a, a really crappy teacher, and I've never drawn yeah. the head before. No one would watch. It doesn't matter See, that I use. Or say your skin camera. won't help. That's for sure. Yeah. That's the thing is that teaching is its own skill, and we've all uh, purchased and seen instructional art videos by amazing artists, and uh, fell asleep. Felt sick. <laughs> No, back you know back so, then we didn't though, right? Like when the v VHS tapes, like I watched Morgan Weisling's. Uh, actually, it was a DVD, but it was like three, you know, was it the resolution was three sixty, right? Is that a DVD resolution or was it four eighty? No, no, the uh, DVD is four eighty. Four eighty, okay. Um, which I mean, if I release a uh, a video today at four eighty p, people will be like, "What the hell are you doing? I can't watch this." There's people actually. There's people that comment. The ones that, like, I'll post a video, and it sometimes it takes YouTube like half an hour to uh, to compress it to compress it all and get the high quality videos actually available for people. So the people that click on my video right away, they're getting the 360, the 480p quality, and they comment. They're like, "Why are you uploading such shitty quality video?" Unsubscribe. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, sorry, YouTube hasn't encoded it yet. Wait. <laughs> I think I've seen that Morgan Weisling video. It's the one where he paints a girl with some homework and apples and yeah, that's the one that I, I yeah. watched probably like twenty times, maybe even more than that. Nice. Yeah, that's the thing is back in that day, 
people appreciated the content more. Now there's so much content that people aren't yeah. doing the homework. They're not acting out the lessons. Uh, something that people should stay away from. Yeah. So now I have a question. Well, some people now, are. In terms of yeah, you can't speak for everybody. <laughs> there's there's a lot of great students out there too. But yeah, sorry. Go ahead. So. How then? How do you see yourself in let's say next five years? Do you are you uh, thinking of maybe opening your own school, um, or prosthetic arms? Seeing <laughs> <laughs> brain <laughs> AI brain mesh, right? <laughs> no, I don't. That's I don't see that. myself opening up a school. I don't like brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. For me, I don't want to mm -hmm. run a brick and mortar business necessarily. Yeah. I mean, maybe I guess yeah. if my team grows, and I, I feel like somebody could handle all that, then yeah. But I really like online stuff. It's so much easier to focus on actually creating content and not running a building, like, you know. Like right, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You can reach so many more people online than at a of brick course. and mortar. You don't have a You probably taught more people than, than like someone in their entire career. What's that? You probably taught more people than some, like a, oh. a teacher, university teacher in their entire career. Oh yeah, well, yeah. It's yeah. I mean, it's impossible for someone to <laughs> physically teach a mil you know a million of people. You taught yeah. a stadium of people. <laughs> yeah. So that being the case, then what is the impact that you want to have on the art community? Not just with your YouTube channel, because YouTube is going to go and then we're going to have the next thing. And I know you, you're going to grab onto the next thing and be a pioneer in that too. But over your lifetime, mm -hmm. what is the impact you want to have on the art world mm -hmm. in totality? Well, I guess there's two sides of it. I, I do want to make art education available to more people. I, I want to... I like building things. And so building mm -hmm. tools for artists that will help them grow appeals to me because I'm also an artist. I like artists, my friends are artists, you know, like it, it appeals to me to, to help them because a lot, a lot of them struggle and they never make it, you know? Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And so that's fun, but there's also the side of me that just wants to create art as well. And so mm -hmm. I do want to just also just be remembered for the art I make. Um, and that's just about mm -hmm. going and sitting down and painting. <laughs> so, I know. Does yeah, that answer I'm, your question? I'm very much want, uh, looking forward to uh, your return to fine art because where mm -hmm. you left off was uh, quite a powerful place. So it'd be great to see you get back into uh, it. Yeah, and I'm fun. really looking forward to, uh, to see to see this uh, this idea of yours develop further about uh, having computers. Uh, analyze drawings and to uh, help millions of people to improve their, their skills. Yeah. Eventually, Stan, you're gonna digitize your brain and get uploaded to <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> yeah. The Stan app. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't you guys want that app right now? Like, to check your proportions? Oh, totally. <laughs> I, w I would secretly use it on all my paintings. Yeah, you'd check it all the time. <laughs> Yeah. And like when you were you learning like an honesty meter, and like how brutal it should be. Like, <laughs> like, like easy mode. Like compliment mode. Next is like compliment mode. Critique mode. <laughs> <laughs> and like the last mode is like roast me. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. We should have a compliment mode. <laughs> Perfect. I cube. Run down. And it's like not a cube. <laughs> Genius. <laughs> wow, this is so great. Wow, you did wow. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> oh, wow. You did this? Oh, my, you painted that? My, my aunt also oh, painted okay. <laughs> My aunt. <laughs> I can't even paint a stick figure. Oh, no. <laughs> I remember one of the funniest compliments we ever got while planner painting that first term. Actually, Jordan, you want to tell this story? Oh, this yeah, yeah. This is your yeah, shining we're, moment. Oh, yeah, of course. So yeah, we were painting a church and um, this like elderly couple comes along and we're, we're struggling pretty hard with that. I think it was coming along. It was starting to look like the church, uh -huh. but uh, the, the nail fairy comes up and he's like, wow, that's great. It's looking really abstract. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, what? <laughs> you can't just say that, man. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> he doesn't know that that's that's an insult in our circle. Yeah. Yeah. Kids are brutally honest too. Like I remember I used to draw at the Royal Ontario Museum yeah. and we would go on the day that was free. So also that would be when all the kids were there. So we'd be drawing on like these little stools and the kids come up and they stick your head, they stick their head uh, right beside yours, look at your drawing, and they'd be like, wow, that sucks. <laughs> and just like run <laughs> You're like, hey man, <laughs> you get back here. <laughs> wow. Do you guys have, you really have people come up to you and say your art sucks? <laughs> Maybe we yeah. invite that type of commentary <laughs> yeah. somehow, I don't know. Alright, well, on that note, Stan, we would like to thank you so much for your time, for thank you, your Stan. amazing tips, uh, and for our, our audience out there, we really hope that you enjoyed this episode uh, with uh, Stan Prokopenko. Uh, so, people can find you on Proko on YouTube. If you already have not, you must subscribe because he's got the best art instructional videos, particularly in the area of anatomy. And he has these premium courses that really go down to every detail, every insertion point of every muscle. It's very impressive and can really help you take your drawings to the next level. So head over to Proko.com to check out what he's got. Thanks for joining us, Stan. See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. Cool. Thanks, guys.